Now is the time in our program when you'll get to hear from some of the device manufacturers who have sponsored this event and learn more about their devices for home dialysis. Before we start the live stream device manufacturers roundtable at 345, we're going to take you through some videos from several manufacturers showcasing the ins and outs of various devices and some of the unique features and advantages of each. You will also hear some patient testimonials for some of the devices that are in use by patients in the US today. You may even recognize some of the faces as people you've heard from today in this program. First, let's take a look at the Versi IHD Cycler, a home dialysis system from NextStage, the longest standing home dialysis manufacturer in the US market. Next Stage home hemodialysis solutions, including Versi HD, provide flexibility that enables individualized therapy options to meet patients' unique clinical needs. Designed for simplicity, the Versi HD Cycler's compact size and functionality are complemented by a touchscreen interface that allows for responsive key presses and advanced on screen displays. While the touchscreen buttons are the same across all of our Cycler systems, on Versi HD, they illuminate only when they can be adjusted or pressed during operation, enhancing clarity and confidence during treatment. Ease of use extends to the steps to begin a treatment. Insert a single-use cartridge into the cycler, spike a bag of saline, and press the Add Fluid button on the touchscreen. The cartridge features a pre-attached dialyzer, reducing the potential risks of touchpoint contaminations. Because the drop-in sterilized cartridge is a closed system without a blood-air interface, it helps to reduce the need for anticoagulants during treatments. And because the entire blood flow and dialysate pathways are disposable, there's no need for long post-treatment heating or disinfection with dangerous chemicals. The cycler can simply be wiped down and the cartridge thrown away. When it comes to dialysate fluid, Patients can choose premixed dialysate and sterile bags or the Pure Flow SL system to generate dialysate from tap water. Using premixed bags gives patients flexibility in where they treat in their home, as well as supporting the ability to travel with their system and not miss a treatment. In addition, these bags can be stored, providing critical access to dialysate in the event of water disruption due to an evacuation or emergency situation. For regular use, the majority of patients use the PureFlow SL system. Roughly the size of an end table, it minimizes the need for delivery, storage, and disposal of pre-filled bags. Unlike conventional water treatment systems that require plumbing modifications, PureFlow needs only a simple faucet or under-sink hookup while dialysate is prepared. And a prepared batch lasts 96 hours so many patients can do multiple treatments on a single PureFlow batch. PureFlow is the only system designed, tested, and validated to produce ultra-pure water from tap water, accommodating most home water sources. With its unique design and innovative technology, including deionization and ultrafiltration, PureFlow also reduces water waste using just six gallons of water in a typical treatment. To support their success, next-stage home hemodialysis patients have access to next to me Connected Health, a state-of-the-art platform that features an iPad app for the patient and a web portal for clinical staff. Using the next to me app, patients can electronically record their flow sheet information, including blood pressure, pulse, and medications. Data is automatically recorded from the cycler, such as rates, volumes, and pressures. Plus, this patient-friendly app integrates with Bluetooth accessories to seamlessly record data from devices such as a scale or blood pressure cuff. Once the treatment is complete, the finished flow sheet is securely submitted to the clinician portal, so healthcare providers can view, track, and monitor completed treatment data for their patients. If help is needed during a treatment, patients can contact technical support 24-7 using a phone or directly from the Next2Me patient app. Using a link session through the app, 
Technical support can view the cycler data and use the iPad's camera to see what the patient sees. In the event the problem cannot be immediately resolved, the modular design of next stage equipment enables it to be easily swapped within 24 hours. This is done without the need for a technician to come into the patient's home. Next stage home hemodialysis solutions are the only systems approved for both solo or nocturnal use, so they can be used without a care partner during waking hours or with a care partner overnight while both patients and care partners sleep. Next stage home hemodialysis solutions deliver both the physical components and the dedicated service and care teams to help patients succeed. It's no wonder that so many patients count on Next Stage for the flexibility that helps them meet their clinical and lifestyle needs. For more information about Next Stage products and services, including Versi HD, contact your local area manager. Isn't that awesome to see all the options that the Next Stage Versi IHD Cycler offers? Now let's take a look at a newer entrant to the home hemodialysis marketplace. This machine is called the Tableau Hemodialysis System, made by Outset Medical. It was in development for over 10 years before being approved by the FDA for home use in March 2020. Specifically designed to feel like a consumer product rather than a piece of medical technology, Tableau offers patients a modern option, and based on input from patients and clinicians, it is, continues to improve its design and function. Take a look at the Tableau hemodialysis system through the experience of some who use it. Delivering dialysis has remained a burdensome, complex, and costly process with very little change over the last few decades. Our view was, why not apply modern technology to dialysis? And the answer is, there's no reason you can't. Outset, develop Tableau, a first of its kind technology that reduces the cost and complexity of dialysis anywhere it's delivered, from the hospital all the way to the home. For the first time, a single system can deliver dialysis anywhere, anytime, by virtually anyone. That's Tableau. And I saw the machine and he turned it on and it was just a, like a iPad. I said, wow, this is amazing. The machine is so incredibly easy that you just follow the directions and it prompts you for every single step, which I think is amazing. And if you miss a step, the machine tells you you've missed a step and shows you what to do. The training for me was actually easy. The machine is telling you exactly what to do, what goes here, what goes there, what you need to connect, disconnect. So it, to me, it was an easy and awesome experience. Understand that your loved one's getting this, whether it's going to be in a facility or a clinic or at home. So why not do it yourselves and understand this process and make it just easier being in your home and you have all those um, conveniences with you. It takes about four hours and it's done. Step at a time takes you right through it and it's very uh, thorough. About Tableau, I would tell them it is doable. You can, don't be afraid of it, embrace it, get on it. And there's some real advantages to it, especially the flexibility and the way you can customize it to your needs. It's kind of fun. <laughs> he had a couple of different peritonitis infections in a one month period by the time, and it was very clear he couldn't continue. Oh, I was getting toward the end. I said, uh, my peritoneal cavity is wearing out. The decision was made easily and quickly. It was time to convert to hemodialysis, and the timing was perfect 
because the tableau was just being coming out for home usage. Well, the big difference is peritoneal dialysis was 75 hours a week. On this tableau, it runs about 16 or 17 hours per week. Huge difference in time. And it's noticeably different. And I can see each day feeling a little better. I feel like I'm operating like one of my handheld gadgets. They're pretty cool. I think the technology of it is just bringing everything up to date. People taking their time to really put the small things into it that are there. There's actually bells and whistles in it that kind of make it personable and it kind of feels like a human designed it. The differences uh, between Next Days and Tableau as far as prep time is the word time. With Next Days, you know, you have to make your batches. They take six to eight hours to make, I believe six hours. So now with Tableau, just with the instant batching or making and mixing, whatever it is that they do, it just saves so much time and effort. So if I even if I get up late at 7 a.m. and I'm like, oh, let me go set up my machine, I'm usually on by 7.45. Next stage again, when we first received your first order, you get a really big order. For me, it used to be about maybe 50 boxes delivered. And I felt like I was kind of overwhelming the house. So that was my biggest fear coming into Tableau, like everything's in one room. So which is my machine, my chair, my supplies, my boxes for my fluid, everything is in one room. I am able to fit Tableau in the supplies that I need in my home. It doesn't look like um, a hospital room. It looks kind of cozy. The way I set it up is, you know, very relaxing um, and comfortable. The support that I've received from outset, it's unbelievable. And it sounds really, really corny, but I do feel part of the family. I know that they're there. My recovery is going really well. She is really strong. I really got to see how strong my mom is. Just seeing her flourish and thrive as a person, not only just my mom, but just as her person, it's just makes me really happy and I'm really happy for it. And this is like, for her to be given the, I don't know, just a new lease on life yet again, it's just gotta thank God. And I like to tell people there's hope in the wait. You just have to see, to, to know that as long as you do what you need to do, um, it's just a matter of time and everybody will have their day. Most importantly, have a positive attitude, regardless of what you're going through, because like my mother always told me that what you're going through is not gonna last forever. Wow, that was impactful. Now that we've heard about two of the devices currently being used in the home for hemodialysis, let's hear about a device that is still in development. The Kidney Project's iHemo device, this device is still in investigation phase. A prototype has been tested in animals with positive results, and the makers of the device are planning to do human trials. The iHemo device aims to be the first implantable dialysis system. Let's take a look. The iHemo dialysis system is now within reach of end-stage renal disease patients. Featuring a surgically implanted blood filter, iHemo will enable patients to dialyze themselves at home. The process is simple. There are no needles and no blood leaves the body, eliminating the fear of blood loss from an accidental disconnect or equipment malfunction iHemo offers the kind of dialysis patients say they prefer, and it's compact compared to the machines used in dialysis centers. 
Clinical data show clear advantages to frequent and prolonged hemodialysis compared to fewer and shorter sessions at dialysis centers. These advantages include improved survival, blood pressure, heart function, quality of sleep, cognitive function, and pregnancy outcomes. Patients will need less time to recover after sessions and can enjoy greater dietary freedom. In the iHemodialysis system, the hemofilter is surgically implanted inside the patient's abdomen. The hemofilter connects to the circulatory system on one side and on the other side to catheters leading to a small external pump. Inside the hemofilter are highly efficient biocompatible blood filtration membranes made possible by advances in silicon nanotechnology. Because the membranes are compact, the hemofilter is small enough to implant. The patient's heart pumps blood through the hemofilter while the external pump sends dialysate into the hemofilter and carries away toxins and excess water. Development of the iHemodialysis system has progressed steadily. It's been prototyped and tested on the lab bench. Surgical techniques for implantation have been refined and the system has been tested in animals with positive results. With the refinement of iHemo, dialysis patients will experience greater mobility. The implanted hemofilter and portable dialysate pump enable patients to travel freely. The first implantable dialysis system, iHemo. I recently had an opportunity to get up close and personal with the researchers at the University of Washington about their active device at the Ideas Conference. This device is still under development, but it is designed to be portable, either as a backpack to use while out and about, or you can disconnect it and set it on a table or flat surface near you while you're doing your dialysis. Check out this unique device that could become a part of the future of home dialysis. Introducing the Active, the ambulatory kidney to improve vitality, a wearable miniaturized dialysis device that makes it possible to dialyze from almost anywhere. The Center for Dialysis Innovation at the University of Washington, or CDI, has designed the Active with continuous patient engagement, resulting in a device that will dramatically improve the quality of life for patients currently tethered to conventional hemodialysis machines. The CDI's breakthrough technology for dialysate regeneration will allow the active to be lightweight and wearable. This is truly whenever, wherever dialysis. The active is enabled by a dialysate regeneration module. The mechanism of regeneration is based on the CDI's proprietary photooxidation technology. Spent dialysate flows from the dialyzer to the dialysate regeneration module, where urea is decomposed into nitrogen and carbon dioxide by photooxidation. Regenerated dialysate is returned to the dialyzer, and this process repeats. The dialysate regeneration module untethers the active from an external water supply and enables it to operate with a small, closed-loop volume of dialysate. This revolutionary technology allows the active device to be smaller, lighter, safe, and effective for renal replacement therapy. The active is comprised of three modules, the dialysate regeneration module, the dialysate management module, and the disposable blood management module. The dialysate regeneration module removes toxins from the spent dialysate. The dialysate management module directs the dialysate through the active and contains the electronics, software, pumps, and sensors required to safely and effectively manage the dialysate and overall device operations. This module also proportions electrolytes into the regenerated dialysate stream returning to the dialyzer. The blood management module is a disposable, easily replaceable cartridge that integrates the dialyzer, flow channels, sensor interfaces, and bloodlines. The result? 
a lightweight, compact, wearable device that provides freedom of movement and an enriched quality of life for patients and their families. In fact, patients have been involved in the design of the Active from the start, helping to create a simple and intuitive device built around their needs. The Active is powered by a rechargeable battery and doesn't require a connection to an external water source. Setting up the device is radically simplified by the Active's disposable blood management cartridge, and the extended life of the cartridge reduces the amount of monthly disposables. Connecting to and from the Active is made safe and easy with CDI's proprietary connection technology, designed specifically for wearable dialysis. No repeat needle sticks. and patients are guided and kept informed every step of the way. No heavy equipment, no bags of supplies, no repeat needle sticks, no staying in one place. The unprecedented mobility offered by the Active provides patients with a level of freedom and flexibility that is long overdue. The Active, wherever life takes you. And let's not forget peritoneal dialysis. Over the years, there have been improvements made by both Baxter and Fresenius to their PD machines. Most recently, Next Stage has introduced a small, under 12 pound PD cycler. Take a look at the experience of one PD patient on Baxter's AMIA system. My name is Jeremy Patrick Starr. I am 45 years old this year. I've been blind for three years. I had questions after questions running through my mind, like how is he going to do this? He's blind. Um, how am I going to train him? My name is Karen Ellison. I work at Seven Oaks General Hospital in Winnipeg, Manitoba. I work in the peritoneal dialysis unit. When I first met Jeremy, it was in 2015. Um, he had to start on dialysis. And then with the PD, I'm here at home where I'm comfortable, where I, where I feel safe, where, where I've mapped out every square foot and, and I know where everything is. The machine itself, the cycler, because it's not like the twin bag where I'm sitting around all day waiting for about two hours or so for the next treatment. I have my, my day to live. I would have to honestly say the machine itself, the first day, I felt comfortable with it. Intuitive, I think is a good word. It's quite easy now. It was very nerve-wracking the first time, of course. Remove drain line from line organizer and let hang. Uh, the voice is very, very handy. It truly is step-by-step -step instructions. You know, our, our world is designed for the sighted, the, the mobile. And, uh, you know, I've recently become aware of just how uh, disabled, unfriendly the world can be. So it's, it's nice to see a company like, like this make a product that uh, I can breeze through it, and if I can breeze through it, anyone can. And ShareSource gave me the confidence to train him because I knew I could view every treatment from Winnipeg. I don't have to come out and do program changes out to his home. It's all available on the web. You just log in and look at the treatment data. We're finding that with the accurate data, we're able to, to troubleshoot easier. Um, figure out problems quicker. Because the share source is uh, monitoring and sharing the information that it does share with her, they can, they can keep track and they might actually notice something before I feel it. You know, so I think that's a great thing. It, it's almost, uh, almost as if I were in their care, in, in the clinic, and with them monitoring me. And, you know, and that's a, that's a good comfort. Even something as serious as uh, kidney failure, 
doesn't have to hold you back from having a full rich life. So fight. You know, fight on. Now I want to tell you about one of the exciting initiatives that's driving innovation forward in kidney care devices. The Kidney Innovation Accelerator, called Kidney X, is a public-private partnership between the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services and the American Society of Nephrology to accelerate innovation in the prevention, diagnosis, and treatment of kidney diseases. Kidney X is special because for the first time, it brings together the federal government, healthcare professionals, kidney patients, investors, inventors, and everyone who cares about this disease, all coming together with one goal. How can we increase innovation to create better quality of life and better outcomes for patients? Take a look at this video from Kidney X's inaugural event in 2019 and continue watching to see some of the Kidney X prize winners. I'm Eric Hargan, the Deputy Secretary of Health and Human Services. Good afternoon, everyone, uh, and welcome to the inaugural Kidney X Summit. Kidney care is an enormous burden on Americans. We need innovative technologies to be able to solve this problem for us. The mission of Kidney X is to accelerate innovation, discovery, research, to ultimately find cures for kidney diseases which afflict more than 40 million Americans. Todd Ibrahim, I'm Executive Vice President of the American Society of Nephrology. Kidney X is a partnership between the American Society of Nephrology and the Department of Health and Human Services. HHS needs to be at the center of innovation, especially around kidney care, because $113 billion a year is spent by the federal government uh, to treat kidney disease. I'm Ed Simcox, I'm the Chief Technology Officer at HHS. At the inaugural Kidney X Summit, we are awarding 15 first round prizes to redesign dialysis. Transforming dialysis by applying 21st century biomaterials, innovative engineering concepts, and exceptional science. I've never seen this level of excitement around this, so it's great to be here. We're much closer today than we've ever been in the past. Those presentations will hopefully give them guidance as they move forward to the second round, which will be to help them take the next step in bringing these innovations to market. As a scientist as well as a business person, I'm really excited about the opportunity that Kidney X is providing us to bring our technology to uh, help people. It means that those innovations can get through the process faster and that there is a model for compensation, which has been the deterrent to making advances in the past. What we're really trying to do is de-risk the environment to get investors excited about investing in new technologies, new therapies, and new devices in the space. The device uses a microelectromechanical sensor. A molecular nanotechnology. Highly biocompatible. It's a dialysis clinic on wheels. And what's amazing about Kinex is that they are very patient-centered. There was even uh, patients on the board to look through the submissions and to see if this, these solutions um, would be viable options for them. Since I had my transplant, I can say that I'm having a good quality of life. Kidney X having patients as reviewers, that means that the patient input is very important. I think Kidney X will make a difference because it's a call to action. And it energizes the field. Revive our energy and our efforts to bring solutions in this space. So what we've done so far is pretty innovative, but we're just getting started. Kidney X is a seminal event because for the first time we're bringing together the federal government, the health professionals, the patients, the investment community, inventors, everyone who cares about this disease are all together working for the same goal, which is how do we accelerate innovation. Kidney X has produced an immense amount of innovation already for the American people. It's going to impact our health care and it's going to create uh, a better quality of life and better outcomes for kidney patients. For more information about the prize-winning solutions and future Kidney X initiatives, please visit KidneyX.org and follow Kidney X on Twitter at Kidney underscore X. Produced by the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services at taxpayer expense. Our ultimate goal is to be able to bioengineer transplantable kidneys for anybody who needs them. Now that would be the ability to avoid dialysis altogether. 
um, because we know today that the clinical outcomes associated with transplant are far superior to dialysis. My name is Jeff Ross, I'm CEO of Miro Matrix. My name is Joe Uzarski and I am the Kidney Project Manager at Miro Matrix. Our submission with this first phase one was basically to kind of lay the foundation for future transplantation of these bioengineered kidneys. So we wanted to set a strong foundation by demonstrating that by reconstructing the blood vessels in a kidney, we could maintain blood flow. When we look at overall bioengineering a kidney, it's not only providing that technology to the patient, but it's, it's a total paradigm shift as well. I mean, think of a world where patients aren't waiting by the phone for that call of a transplant. They gotta go in the middle of the night. Think about the surgical team that has to be on response all the time. In a world where if we had transplantable kidneys, those could be scheduled. You would know a week or two in advance when you need to go in. Surgical teams would be doing operations during the optimal times in the hospital service as well. So it's not only a great technology for the patient, but it really changes how we apply medicine too. For more information about the prize-winning solutions and future KidneyX initiatives, please visit KidneyX.org and follow KidneyX on Twitter at Kidney underscore X. Produced by the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services at taxpayer expense. My name is Shuvo Roy. My title is Professor of Bioengineering and Therapeutic Sciences at UC San Francisco. The submission we put forth to KidneyX takes the mechanical filtration unit that we've developed and proposes that we'll design a better dialysis system for home use. Our filter is highly efficient, highly compact, does not require blood thinners, can operate with just the hearts driving the filtration, so you do not need electrical power or pumps, and you're able to do dialysis at home overnight, so you get the benefits of prolonged and frequent hemodialysis, which has been shown to improve patient outcomes. Our long-term vision is the development of an implantable bioartificial kidney that's de de designed to provide the benefits of transplant to the vast majority of dialysis patients who will never get a transplant. So it's a two-stage system, which is a mechanical filtration unit followed by a cellular therapy unit. These two units work in tandem and it will be surgically placed into the body, connected to the blood vessels, and the urine that's produced will go to the, direct, uh, to the bladder, very much like the natural kidney. There are over 100,000 patients on the wait list for a kidney transplant, but just about 20,000 people can get one. So the vast majority of people who are on dialysis who are eligible for transplant, this would be an option for them. For more information about the prize-winning solutions and future KidneyX initiatives, please visit KidneyX.org and follow KidneyX on Twitter at Kidney underscore X. Produced by the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services at taxpayer expense. As a dialysis company, what we have tried to do is simplify dialysis so a patient can do their own treatments. We have kept the patient in mind, uh, really with the idea of home or self-dialysis as a new model of care going forward. With Outset, between the simplicity we've designed in the device itself, plus the sensor-based technology, we can do that and very similar to a modern phone where externally it looks very simple, internally there's a lot of automation and uh, innovation behind that technology to be able to create that very simplistic interface. I'm Michael Aragon, I'm the Chief Medical Officer at Outset Medical. I'm Dean Hugh, I'm Senior Director of Research and Innovation at Outset Medical. Our submission is a natural extension of what Outset Medical is already doing in terms of automation, reducing complexity, and letting the patient uh, be more central to their own care. We're trying to solve a very big problem in uh, preventing complications during dialysis, and we believe that sensors and data is a key part to get us there. We're a new dialysis technology and the KidneyX ideas of innovation and moving forward and advancing kidney care is right in line with what we as a company have uh, as our own motivation and our own drive. So uh, this fit perfectly well with exactly what we're trying to do in the uh, nephrology space as well. For more information about the prize-winning solutions and future KidneyX initiatives, please visit KidneyX.org and follow KidneyX on Twitter at Kidney underscore X. Produced by the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services at taxpayer expense. 
The Center for Dialysis Innovation is developing a novel, wearable hemodialysis device. It's going to be lightweight, low cost, water efficient, and offer uh, complication-free blood access for the patient. It would allow them to dialyze 24-7, giving them back their mobility and the ability to live the life they want to live while still receiving their life-saving hemodialysis therapy. I'm Cassandra Thompson. I'm the Director of Translation and Operations with the Center for Dialysis Innovation at the University of Washington in Seattle. My name is Glenda V. Roberts. I'm the Director of External Relations and Patient Engagement for the Center for Dialysis Innovation at the University of Washington. I think one of the things that's really important in terms of Kidney X is the focus on the patient. It's really encouraging that so many of the submissions have emphasized the impact that their technologies will have on the patient's quality of life. Because as a kidney transplant recipient and a person with chronic kidney disease, I can tell you that quality of life is the thing that suffers most. What we're trying to do is exciting and new and real. For more information about the prize-winning solutions and future KidneyX initiatives, please visit KidneyX.org and follow KidneyX on Twitter at Kidney underscore X. Produced by the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services at taxpayer expense. Hello, my name is Eric Weinhandel. It's very nice to see you all today as we move into the next part of our agenda. Uh, just to introduce myself, I'm uh, currently the Vice President of Applied Data and Strategy Transformation at Satellite Healthcare, a Dallas provider based in California. Um, I'm also a member of the uh, Board of Directors of Home Dialysis United, and so it's uh, particularly meaningful to see this event come to fruition today, and I'm so happy to see all the content that's available today. Um, we're going to be talking about some of the new technology that's coming on board, um, as well as some of the new technology that's available today. So. You know, there's more that can be packed into the next, uh, more, more technology available that can possibly be packed into a panel in the next 40 minutes. So we're going to kind of go through this with two different phases. Uh, the first part of today, we're going to take a look at a little bit of slides uh, that just goes through some of the devices that we don't actually have uh, live representatives from today. And then we'll quickly transition over to a panel where we can talk a little bit more with, uh, with members of some of the companies that uh, are developing technology and uh, producing machines that are currently available for people interested in home dialysis today. Um, there is really unprecedented investment in dialysis device development these days, and that's a great thing for everybody, uh, from policymakers uh, to healthcare providers to, most importantly, patients. Um, I think we're all keenly aware as American consumers that we like to have lots of options, right? Amazon is beautiful in no small part because there are infinite options to pick from. And it's great that we have more and more options available for dialysis. As you can see here on the screen, there is a long list of companies that are actively interested in working to develop new equipment and new devices for dialysis in this country, as well as the next generation of technology. Um, some of these names may look very familiar to you. Presenius and Divida in particular, of course, are very large dialysis providers and are actively working on new equipment and new approaches. Uh, Medtronic is a name that may look very familiar, and they've really recently partnered with Divida to develop new technology. There are lots of other smaller companies that are available and uh, quickly entering the scene. So we'll take a look at a little bit of that today. Um, first of all, We'll start with Quanta, and uh, I believe that uh, all of you who are watching the previous segment saw a little bit of video. Uh, the Quanta SC Plus is the machine that's shown on the screen here. This is a company that's based in the United Kingdom um, and is, uh, shall we say, crossing the pond into North America. Um, it, you'll notice in the slides that there are links that I've uh, included on the slides so that you can sort of record the website name and take a look at the product yourself. Uh, in the case of Quanta, you just want to go to quantadt.com and you can find more information. Now, the Quanta SC Plus is a relatively small machine. I've seen it in person myself. And if you look closely at the graphic here, you'll notice that it has a cartridge that can be inserted into the hemodialysis machine, sort of like cartridges are inserted in other hemodialysis machines that are used in the home. Now, the SC Plus is not currently available for use in the home. However, there is a trial that is currently in progress. So to get really technical about this, um, the machine is currently used in some acute care facilities and in chronic dialysis facilities in the United States. And there is a trial called the Quanta Home Run Trial that is currently recruiting patients in Florida, 
I'm Indiana and California. Um, and so, you know, we'll see what happens in the next few years in terms of this becoming a new home hemodialysis option. Uh, the machine uh, offers some interesting features. It's compact. It has a nice looking digital interface with the screen on it. Uh, a powerful machine. One of the interesting things about the machine is actually that it runs at a higher flow rate for dialysis than we typically have seen with machines over the last 15 years or so. And that may present some new opportunities um, for, for certain types of patients and certain types of prescriptions that have been a little bit more difficult than others to implement in the past. Um, it uh, includes both the dialysis machine, as you can see on the screen, as well as a water treatment system that you see on the far right. Um, again, this is a machine that hopefully we'll see more of in the near future in this, uh, in this country, and uh, it will be a welcome addition, I think. Our next piece of equipment is one called the Neo Kidney, which is being developed by a company, uh, technically a consortium called Dexkidney. Um, you can see the machine on the far right. This is basically a sorbent technology. Um, it's portable. As you can see from the picture, it's relatively small and comes in at less than 10 kilograms, which would make it you know, one of the smallest and lightest home hemodialysis devices uh, around. Um, it does not need a large amount of fluid as sorbent technology typically uses uh, smaller amounts of fluid, in this case, five to six liters. Whereas many of you who are using say next stage systems are using between 25 and 30 liters, or maybe a little bit more in the case of some patients who are using 40 or 50 liters. So definitely for areas in our country where water consumption is becoming a real issue, whether you're on dialysis or not, you know, I think some of these technology issues around using less fluid are going to become more and more important as we go through the next 10 years and 15 years. Uh, no additional water purification system is needed, and it is compatible with all electric outlets. Uh, this machine is in development on the European side. There are some uh, collaborators from Singapore, as I recall. Um, so we'll see what the future holds for this one. Um, next is Diality. Diality is a company based in California. I've met a few of the people who are associated with the company myself, uh, including the founder. Um, uh, very interesting. Now, the device, we don't have a picture to show today. The developer is keeping it under wraps for the near future, but um, definitely something to pay attention to. And as you can see from the web address, uh, Diality.com is a way to find out more information about this machine. Um, I would encourage, just as a point of a point of note, you know, I would encourage you to all take a look at these websites. And in particular, on all of these websites, you'll find contact information for these companies. Many of these companies would love to meet American dialysis patients uh, who can give input and feedback about how the machine is designed, how it can be used, um, how patients can help to make the machine better before it even hits the market for the first time. And so I would definitely encourage you that even if you don't see that the machine is available in your clinic or in your area today, reach out to these companies. There's absolutely nothing to lose. And honestly, there may be something for you to gain, if not for the next generation of people who might be starting dialysis in the future to gain from your input today. Uh, the next device that we can take a look at is something called Dimi, uh, which is being developed by a company called Dialco. Uh, and you can see the website here. It's a Canadian-based company. So the web address is dialco.ca rather than .com. Um, but you can find more information about the machine. Now, it's an interesting look. I won't go through all the text here today, but notice that the machine is sort of hiding inside this little box. And then you lift up the lid and the machine pops out. Uh, one of the interesting things about this machine is that it's actually capable of doing not just hemodialysis, but also hemodiafiltration. Now, if you do a little bit of research, you'll find that we don't have much in the way of hemodiafiltration in this country, but it is widely used in places like Australia and Europe and Japan. Um, and whether or not it produces superior clinical outcomes, it is another option that may be capable of clearing some of those middle molecules that can be tough to clear with dialysis. And so it's interesting that there would be a home hemodialysis platform for the future that could be capable of this. Another product to keep your eyes on. Um, the next two devices that you see on your screen here are the iHemo system. And we'll be talking to one of the developers of the iHemo system in just a little bit, which is an implanted hemo filter, as well as the wearable artificial kidney or WAC uh, 3.0. Now you'll notice from the pictures uh, on, the, on the WAC that uh, we've got sort of a uh, old generation and the current generation, which is the one in the bottom. And uh, really remarkable evolution of the way the device appears. 
Uh, it doesn't quite have this bulky look of you've got a belt of all sorts of devices hanging around your body, but really getting sleeker and smaller and lighter as we go. Um, this product has been in development for quite a while, but it's definitely making steady progress. And then finally, we'll be talking to one of the developers of the Active System in just a little bit as part of our panel. Uh, this is being developed by the Center for Dialysis Innovation, and it's already won by one of the uh, six winners of the uh, Artificial Kidney Innovation Stream within the federally sponsored Kidney X program. And I do believe that the announcement has just been made for round two of the Artificial Kidney program inside Kidney X. So I'm sure we'll be hearing more about this device as we go. Um, you know, big picture is that you can kind of see from this list of developers that we have a wide range of companies. And we have a wide range of approaches, um, ranging from what I would call machines that still do hemodialysis as we know it today, to machines that are really quite capable of doing very different things than we've seen in the past and are you know, genuinely portable and transportable and quite small in using small amounts of fluid. So the work continues. Uh, there is reason to hope for in the future, uh, even in the near future, um, but it does definitely require the input of patients to push the system along. And I can't emphasize that enough. Um, your input is needed, uh, not only for these companies, but for your representatives in Congress and for people in health and human services that you may know or that you may be able to get in contact with. The government needs to hear from you just as much as these developers need to hear from you because there are so many pieces that need to fit together for these products to go from the bench or a lab where they're being developed to being in a clinic where people can actually use them. And with that, we will begin to move to our panel today. I'm excited to introduce a few people uh, we've got visiting with us today. And I will start off with our first uh, person. I think we'll have some faces appearing on the screen here. Uh, our first is uh, Dr. Michael Aragon. He uh, joined Outset as the Chief Medical Officer in September 2018 after uh, 14 years of clinical practice at the, uh, and President of North Texas Kidney Consultants in the Dallas-Fort Worth market. Um, board certified in internal medicine and nephrology, trained at the University of Texas Health Sciences Center in Houston. His clinical research focus has been the expansion and improvement of home dialysis options for patients with renal disease. Uh, Michael received his uh, medical degree from the University of Texas Medical School. I've known uh, Dr. Aragon for a number of years, uh, very dedicated to home hemodialysis, uh, which is always a pathway to my heart, and uh, excited to have him today. Thank you, Eric. We're really happy to be here. Appreciate it. Fantastic. All right. Our next uh, guest is uh, Barry Fulkerson. Barry Fulkerson is the Director of Systems Engineering with the University of Washington Center for Dialysis Innovation, which, as I mentioned just a moment ago, is developing the active technology. Uh, Barry is involved with renal product development for over 35 years uh, and has held leadership positions with a wide variety of companies, including Presenius, X Corporeal, Next Stage Medical, Gambro, and Code Labs. Uh, Barry, nice to have you here today. Thanks. Thanks, Eric. Nice to be here. Yeah, fantastic. All right. Um, our next guest is uh, Daniel Call. And Dan is a man that I have known for quite a long time. So excited to have him here. Uh, Daniel has worked in various technical product management and marketing roles uh, in the home hemodialysis industry for over 15 years. And I must admit that I'm even a little skeptical that it's only 15. <laughs> I think that uh, Daniel goes back with Next Stage quite a long time. Uh, Next Stage Medical for Xenius Medical Care, Home Hemodialysis Product Organizations. Um, he has worked on all facets. And man knows the Next Stage product technology inside and out. Uh, System One Cycler, Dosing Calculator, the Develop and Reverse EHD Cycler, uh, the Next to Me Connected Health Platform, and many other things. Um, Daniel has two uncles with chronic kidney disease, including one with a transplant, and has focused his career on improving opportunities for people facing this disease. Daniel, it's really nice to have you here today. Great to see you, Eric. Thanks. Yeah, you're welcome. Nice to see you, too. All right. And then our last guest is uh, Shuvo Roy, uh, who is a bioengineering professor at the University of California, San Francisco, and the technical director of the Kidney Project, a national research and development initiative to develop an implantable artificial kidney, author of more than 120 publications and book chapters, and inventor of multiple patents. Uh, he has co-directed the BioMEMS Laboratory in the Department of Biomedical Engineering at Cleveland Clinic, and uh, certainly one of the uh, well-known developers of the uh, iHemo and Kidney Projects. Shubo, very nice to have you here today. And we will hopefully get your audio straightened out very quickly for, 
but at the moment we cannot hear you. We'll look at that straight out. Well, glad to ah, be here. There we go. Yeah. Ah, excellent. Excellent. Mm -hmm. All right. So minimal technology challenges today. That's fantastic. I worked out mine out before I came on the screen, so I had my own fair share. Um, all right. Well, let's get started. Um, this is an interesting panel, of course, because I think everybody is very well versed in kidney disease and technology, but admittedly, we do have uh, two products that are on the market and then two things that are very much in development and hopefully coming in the future. So I want to make sure that we have airtime uh, because the needs of patients today are just as important as the needs of patients in the future. Um, I'd like to start with, with Daniel, um, frankly, just because the next stage um, platform for home human analysis has been, you know, sort of on the market widely used for quite a long time. Um, could you tell us, for somebody who has never seen a home hemodialysis machine, just give our, our listeners just a little bit of background about what this machine is like, uh, what it's capable of doing, how it fits in your house, just the basics. Sure. So I'm, I'm happy to do that, Eric. Thanks for the question. I think if, if you're new to dialysis or, or certainly home hemodialysis, so your point of reference is an in-center device. Uh, there are some very important differentiators I'd love to talk about, uh, which I think really set the next stage uh, system apart from any other offering that exists today. Uh, first and foremost, it's it's much smaller. It's it's considerably smaller, which makes it really truly portable. Uh, that it doesn't need to be installed by a technician in your home. Uh, if you have a reliability issue, it can be swapped out the next day, uh, just in a carton. Uh, you don't need to schedule somebody coming to your house. You don't need um, you know, you can move it upstairs, downstairs. Uh, you can take it with you to travel. That's come up a lot today in earlier conversations. You can take it to evacuate if you need to. So that's a really important differentiator for somebody who's thinking about home. This is not going to consume the space in your home of the way uh, a larger integrated system would that you may be familiar with. Um, it's also extremely easy to use. So unlike what you may see in other systems where you've got a string lines and what you see the technicians and the nurses do, that's all replaced by a drop-in cartridge. It takes literally four steps to set up our system and get it priming so that you can, can go to treatment. Um, our lines are pre-connected, so you're not having to make a bunch of connections, which helps reduce touch contamination risk. It helps reduce leak risks. Um, and it's all disposable contained in a cartridge. So when you're done, you can just throw it away. You don't have to do a heat a heat uh, cleaning cycle, which, which some other systems require, in-center systems require that. And you don't have to do any disinfecting with toxic chemicals or, or uh, powerful acids, things like that. Um, the system also has, uh, you know, you're at home, and, and one of the things that patients may feel somewhat anxious about is, is being alone or that sense of being alone. Uh, so we have a connected health solution um, that keeps the patient uh, well within the, the protective care of their healthcare provider. Uh, that's tablet-based and is used by the patient during treatment. Uh, in addition to just logging what's happening, uh, that tablet-based system can uh, make Bluetooth connections to other peripherals like a scale, temperature, other things you need to use in the course of your treatment for your convenience. Uh, it has a, a camera, so if you need to, you can show what's happening to your nurse. You can show it to our tech support to facilitate mm -hmm. uh, troubleshooting. And because it's a tablet, you can put it in your lap. Uh, your care partner can walk into the other room with it and see what's happening in the course of your treatment while you're treating. Um, can I ask you a question there about the different yeah. ancillary devices? So you mentioned tablet and a scale and a blood pressure. Did, did the patient need to bring that with them to the dialysis clinic or where do, where do these things come from? So uh, the scale, the blood pressure cuff and the thermometer would be provided by the clinic. They don't need to bring that. They'd be provided by the clinic and then the tablet is provided by the clinic as well. Okay. Part of the next stage solution. Okay. And then, um, you know, uh, if, if a person is sort of looking at pictures, like they go into Google and they type in next stage, they're going to see various different versions of the machine, yep. but they're it's all kind of a box and it's got some yep. plastic and it's got this rectangular screen. Tell me what's new. Like what's, what's new and exciting about next stage today compared to say, I saw the machine 10 years ago. Yes. Uh, that's, that's a great question. Um, and, and a lot is new because over the last you know, 20 years, we're not quite to 20 years, I don't want to have the celebration too early, but uh, we've been doing a lot of innovating, including uh, enhancing the uh, therapeutic capabilities of the system, how fast its pumps can run. Um, we've been, uh, most recently, we've added a touchscreen to the cycler, so it has a nice, easy to use touchscreen with some guidance for alarm uh, troubleshooting, and, and there are some other innovations coming um, in the very near future around that touchscreen that I wish I could show you today, but uh, you'll have to look forward to. Um, but that, that launched in 2017, um, pretty widely adopted through the U.S. in 2018. Um, and then all that sits, you mentioned the box. Uh, you know, I'll point out another important differentiator from our system uh, compared to in-center systems and 
you know, other systems that are out there, which is uh, how we manufacture or how we create dialysate in your home. Uh, so we have a system that we call PureFlow SL. Uh, it doesn't use reverse osmosis to purify the water. So you know, our RO system will send, you know, up to twice as much water or more down the drain uh, for the for the dialysate, dialysate that it's making. Um, ours is really a one to one ratio. So you're not putting too much of a, of a tax on your on your water supply or your sewer. Um, that's then uh, processed on a batch basis uh, so that if you were to have a water supply disruption, but you have a batch already there, uh, you don't have a problem. You can still use the water that you've already turned into dialysate. Uh, or if you have an extended water supply problem, we also are able to run from bags. So you may have seen some images of configurations of the cycler with bags hanging above it. It was in some videos earlier today. And that is how people uh, travel. And it's also how uh, people can still treat even when they have uh, water disruptions, which are unfortunately quite common. Uh, our, our data suggests about 850 water main yeah. disruptions a day in North America. Yep, yep. Even in the Midwest, where we have relatively decent infrastructure, we have nitrate yep. problems in certain areas. Yep. So things yep. can happen. One last question I wanted, and then I'm going to move on um, for now, at least, is, um, you know, if we look closely at the, the logo and branding, it says Next Stage from Fresenius Medical Care. If I'm a person, a patient who's starting dialysis, et cetera, and I'm not at a Fresenius clinic, can I get to the Next Stage machine? Oh, you most definitely can, Eric. Thank you. If you're interested in this device, uh, talk to your doctor or talk to your uh, healthcare provider. I believe basically everybody who's got a home program in, in the United States probably offers access to the Next Stage system. Um, if, if you can't get one that way, you can go to our website. We have uh, folks that are local that are, are happy to help uh, your healthcare provider get you connected with our equipment. Um, we're in use across the entire US, Puerto Rico, Alaska, Hawaii, and then beyond the US. In case anyone is joining from beyond the US, we're also in Canada, we're across okay. Western Europe, Hong Kong, Australia. And as we would say, we're anywhere a patient takes us. Um, got pictures of folks with their with their feet in the uh, Colorado River as they dialyze, although we don't recommend that, but uh, <laughs> they are anywhere. They might not be water. Um, all right. Uh, so I am going to thank you for all of that information. That's really helpful. And I think it's important to touch on some of these basics because they sometimes can be, I think, pretty confusing to, you know, to people who are unfamiliar with dialysis, how all these companies fit together and what things are implied and what aren't. I'm going to switch over to uh, Dr. Aragon. I'd like to hear a little bit about uh, Outset's vision uh, on home hemodialysis. I think maybe the first thing, I, I certainly want to ask you, you know, the basics, just like I asked Daniel, the basics of the machine, um, you know, how it looks, how it functions, what it can do. Um, but I also want to understand a little bit about what the um, the inspiration was. You know, what makes it different? What makes it an important addition to the market for home people? Yeah, no, thank, thank you for that, Eric. Yeah, I, I think, um, you know, when we were entering the market, what we wanted to try to do is bring something that's just really simple. Um, our goal was to take any patient, I think, as, as those who heard Leslie earlier, was to, you know, any, any patient could could learn the device and make it really, really simple. We were also aware that, you know, the amount of storage and that that can sometimes be overwhelming in, in home dialysis in general. We wanted to try to minimize that. Uh, we know training can be a, a long burden for um, some of the patients. Uh, and their care partners, especially if their care partners are working or caring for their own health issues. And so we really wanted to try to make something very, very simple. And so so with that, uh, we had a lot of uh, patient interaction all through the development of Tableau, what worked, what didn't work and continue to iterate. It's been over 10 years of, of working on the technology before uh, we got approval in uh, March of 2020 to finally be, be at the home. So a lot of it was patient centered design. Um, a lot of human factor studies, which is really how does the user, um, and we take different users because we're used by nurses and hospitals, but as we look at patients and care partners, how do they interact with the device? And then how do we make that even easier? Where are some steps where maybe they might pause for a second? Okay, how do we how do we eliminate that in the way we design the device? And so that's really been the inspiration was simplification of everything. Try to make this really easy to use. And then the last bit was we didn't want this to look like a medical device. Um, for those who have seen Tableau, hopefully you've seen some pictures through the day. Um, we wanted this to, to look like you know any, any other piece of technology that might be in your home when you close the lid, close the door. It could be a dialysis device. It, it could be a dorm refrigerator. Uh, we just wanted it to kind of really look um, non-invasive into the home and really fit into anybody's home environment. 
Um, as far as some of the innovations, the, the basics, so to speak, of, of Tableau, um, one was we, we wanted to eliminate bags. We wanted to be able to purify water and create dialysate on demand. And so we have taken a water treatment system and really a lot of that innovation is in shrinking that down into being just in the lower third of the device. Uh, we do use an RO based system, but we use a dual RO. And what that does is help us uh, capture some of that potential water loss that you might see of those in-center devices. Uh, and so that way we can minimize the amount of water lost through that system. But when the patient's ready to treat, they hit go and the device starts purifying water on demand. Tableau uses a standard concentrates, which means we're now using a bicarbonate based dialysate, which has been the standard of care for, for, for many, many years mm -hmm. um, in in-center machines. Um, but when you start moving to, to uh, portable bags or pre-prepared bags of dialysate, sometimes you, you can't utilize bicarb, it becomes very tricky. And so we're able to return back to bicarb. I think from a, from a prescribing and flexibility perspective, by, by creating dialysate on demand, we now have a device that can treat daily if we need to, we can go three days a week if we need to go every other day. So we provide a lot of flexibility. The other thing um, you know, we talked about, we are a cartridge based system as well. And I think that's a, it's a very critical step in terms of trying not to have patients have, have to string, string lines and learn how to put all those things together. You just push the Tableau cartridge on the front. Uh, but what we also managed to do is keep the dialyzer out of that cartridge. And what that allows is your physician and you to work on, do I need a larger dialyzer or a smaller dialyzer? So we allowed some of that flexibility uh, that sometimes can be limited when you're batching or, or, or pre-mixing dialysate, give some of that flexibility back that could be very valuable uh, to some of the patients. And then the touch screen, uh, our, our goal here, again, to make this easy, we didn't want people to have to memorize a lot of things. So we have a touch screen on the device. It walks through video and written guidance of every step of the treatment from the minute you turn it on, where it greets you and says hello and, and, and verifies that you are, you are the patient that it's expecting to treat. Um, everything there is, is again, step by step. When you have alarms or you need to troubleshoot something, again, the video and the written guidance on the screen will show you exactly how to help troubleshoot that machine. Um, and then we also provide um, uh, Wi-Fi, direct Wi-Fi connectivity, which for us, again, simplicity being the point here, uh, we didn't want people to have to keep track of flow sheets or things like that. So again, the device just transmits all your treatment data at the end of treatment uh, automatically. We have an incorporated blood pressure cuff. So all of those readings will go with that flow sheet directly. Uh, and then we do provide a real-time remote monitoring. So um, if that's a feature that, that might be helpful, you're maybe you're new to home and you're a little nervous, your nurse or physician could actually monitor you remotely uh -huh. um, in, in, in a real-time fashion. And so we wanted to provide that extra bit of safety uh, and, and that reassurance. We know fear is a big reason why, why patients may be a little hesitant to go home and provide that extra bit of security that your clinical team can actually be, be monitoring you as well. So hopefully that answers your question. Yeah, uh, that's really good. That's really good and I actually want to, I'm going to have to keep the clip going, but I do want to ask you a few really specific questions here uh, while I've got your attention. Um, first of all, um, you know, it, it, outside is based in San Jose, California, Silicon Valley, a lot of technology advertised on the website. And I think in the messaging, um, it, let's say, and, and, and this is true for next stage too, but like, let's say that I don't have internet or my internet is terrible at my home. Can I still use your device? A absolutely. So the device isn't dependent on that connection. Uh, to to perform a treatment, it actually can store all of that data in itself. So if you have uh, spotty Wi-Fi, we've all had it just go out randomly. The device will store that information, and as soon as your Wi-Fi is restored, it will then transmit it. Or if you just don't have Wi-Fi access, there's the ability to go and download those treatments as well, okay. kind of in the, in, an, in an old in the old-fashioned way of doing it, so to speak. And for anybody who is watching the video or seeing images of your machine, so there's the touchscreen interface, is there any separable interface or is, is the patient's interaction with the machine all through that built-in touchscreen? Is there any other like it, detachable actually, device or tablet? Or yeah, tablet? no, thank you. No, it's it's actually is built in. And, and a, a okay. lot of that comes from, again, working with patients and care partners as we were developing it. I think we looked at detachable, does it, you know, can it spin or rotate or all of these different ways to look at it. And uh, we didn't want patients to have to hold anything. We know that you have one arm kind of, you know, with your fistula, your access. And so if that's the case, we, we, uh, we, we felt through our, you know, through, through working with patients and care partners that having that screen kind of stable there, it can flip up and turn down to kind of adjust to the height that you're at next mm -hmm. to device. And again, we, we built it 36 inches tall. So you're at kind of eye level when you're sitting. Uh, but but it's it's uh, it's uh, remains on the machine and, and that okay. way we're, we're not yeah we, we, no one and then the last question um, that I want to ask you and that's about access to the machine if I'm a patient who's interested in Tableau and wants to use the machine I'm going to ask this in two forms um, 
Tableau has been pretty widely deployed in a lot of hospitals in this country. And it's totally possible that a person actually uses this machine during a hospitalization while they have chronic kidney disease. They haven't gotten kidney failure, but they actually use the machine. Now it's time to start kidney uh, treat dialysis in the outpatient setting. Who do I talk to that I can get that machine from the hospital into my home? A different version of this question is honestly coming from the audience, and I'm going to ask it for you. Literally, I'm going to ask it. Why can't I get Tableau at my Fresenius clinic? Oh, wow. Um, okay. So first, <laughs> um, yeah, we, we have been deployed out in the acute environment for, for a quite longer time. Again, for FDA approval, for very good reason, when you're going to go home, they want to see a lot of safety data, which is, is again, totally expected. So the two, the, there was a little bit, took a little longer to get that approval um, due to the extra clinical trials and things. We wanted to make sure patients could do it safely. So it is very possible you could see the device in the hospital. Uh, we do have, uh, we have a growing um, uh, clinical partnership. We have a lot of great partners uh, that, that have been working with us, some of them sponsoring uh, the, the programs as well here today, um, that, that are deploying Tableau at a wide number of their uh, facilities. We've only been on the market since March of 2020, so I, I unfortunately can't tell you we're everywhere at this point, and we are just centered in the U.S. Uh, for the time being. Uh, but uh, but we do from the website at outsetmedical.com. You can look, and we can help. Uh, you know, we have a, a team that can also help connect you uh, with a, a clinic that has Tableau that may be close to your area. Uh, okay. I would say we're probably not in all the clinics uh, at this point. Um, and, you know, I, I, um, I honestly can't, can't answer too much of the question about uh, we're not in Fresenius clinics <laughs> yeah. right now. No. Um, and so, uh, you know, I, I don't know if there's any possibility of that in the future, but, but for now, that, that is uh, right now we're, we don't have that through Fresenius clinics. Okay. Well, I appreciate that. I appreciate the clarity of your answer. I mean, it certainly is true that uh, across all sorts of disease states in our in our country, uh, there are certain devices that are not available to certain channels. Um, I'm going to move on. I want to talk to Barry next. Um, tell us a little bit about where your device is uh, in the development stage. Uh, it's always interesting to see the next generation of things. Well, we're uh, we're early in the in the stage. Uh, just coming out of research at the Center for Dialysis Innovation at University of Washington here in Seattle. Um, so there's been some amazing research that's gone on that, uh, as you saw in the video, will enable us to untether uh, the device from the water source. So the goal here is, you know, with essentially two liters of dialysate um, from a bag priming the system and being able to run the therapy uh, in a portable wearable type of design uh, that will enable the patient to dialyze when they decide to and how long they decide to. Um, another key aspect to that is if you have somebody obviously at home or dialyzing anywhere, uh, you, you can't be accessing or you don't want to be accessing uh, your fistula on a daily basis with needles. So the other piece of the puzzle is a needless access system uh, that will be connecting to a standard catheter for today uh, that will uh, allow the user to quickly and safely connect and disconnect from the system. Okay. It's a, it's a very interesting looking device. I will say that. And uh, I think that anybody who has had firsthand experience with dialysis would be truly inspired looking at it. Um, I know I am. <laughs> uh, and I'm not a dialyzer. Um, can I ask you, I guess, um, this is a question I always have for any any company or product that's in early stages of development. Um, how can patients contribute in ways that are helpful for giving this product further down the line? Is that focus groups reaching out mm -hmm. to you? Is it talking to Congress people about somehow getting more funding? What's the answer? All the above. <laughs> uh, the, the, the great thing about the CDI is that when it was founded through a grant from Northwest Kidney Center uh, when founded by Dr. Jonathan Hemelfarb and Buddy Ratner, along with Glenda Ratner, um, they created a rather large patient advisory board. And this patient advisory board has been inputting, giving us input on the design from day one. Uh, so this, what, what we've progressed to so far is, had, is from direct patient involvement uh, on input and also looking at looking at models and concepts and working with our initial human factors as to what would be acceptable for them, you know, as a device, you know, common feedback is nobody wants to 
wear a medical device around out in the wild. Uh, they don't want it to look like a medical device. So how do we make this blend in to uh, our everyday wardrobe? Uh, mm -hmm. Pieces like that is what is what we have been successful with so far, which is it's encouraging when you get that kind of input. All we have to do is ask and yeah. patients are definitely more than willing to help. Yeah, that's great. Um, I, I want to ask you one more question and then I'm going to move on to Dr. Roy. Um, you know, you've got, now I'm an epidemiologist, so I look at you engineers as wizards, like, I don't understand how you come up with all these ideas, but you've got a long experience working with dialysis devices. If there was one or two things that you said, like active technologically is going to do or medical complications, it can probably resolve that we can't seem to get past with extracorporeal dialysis machines. What do you think it would be? Uh, well, you know, what we know today is more frequent dialysis is better for everyone. Um, but the enabler is how do you do that? You, you know, with with large devices and center devices, you can't sit on the machine all day. Um, so we as developers have to take the current technology, make it smaller, portable, easier to operate, simple as everybody is doing, uh, so that patients can run on their own time schedule and at the rate they need to. Um, so that's that's as good as it gets right now today, yeah. besides somebody developing a new dialyzer itself that drastically improves clearance in a shorter mm -hmm. period of time. <laughs> time is a tough one to cheat, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> Very tough. All right, um, Dr. Roy, I wanna make sure that we have some time to talk to you. I'm sorry that I'm going on a linear order here, but. Um, Tell us a little bit about where the development of your product is. I know that um, you, your kidney project has had a lot of engagement on social media. And so naturally, there are always lots of questions about where is it? And then there's a little bit of skepticism, like why isn't it here yet? So tell us a little bit for our whole audience, um, how are things going with development and where you're kind of at? And you know, just even how much progress have you made in the last two or three years? Sure. Uh, thank you for the opportunity and glad to hear all the news from these other groups. So we have made small scale prototypes. We've shown that they work. And our initial motivator for what we do was driven actually by patient input. So as a uh, developer with a relatively clean slate, because I was coming from academia, we went and talked to patients, including some of the people in the HDU uh, community. And one of the things we heard was, you know, home treatment is great but the machines are complicated. And I'm going back, you know, about half a dozen or more years ago. So they wanted, patients wanted something that was not complicated and has an easy interface to use. They would like to travel and they want something that's safe and convenient. So what that helped sort of helped us distill down to us, can we do hemodialysis without needles and no blood outside the body? And we're inspired by the extensive technology development and patient use with PD, which is relatively you know, user-friendly, has a lot more um, operational simplicity. So the idea was, can you make something that is operationally as simple as PD, but you could do home hemodialysis? So we embarked on how do you make that possible? One is you have to make a filter that allows us to avoid bringing blood outside the body, but putting the filter inside. So we developed a prototype through that we can implant and generate the, um, the clearance uh, through just dialysate coming in from outside. And we've shown that to work with, you know, I would say, uh, let me just say small scale devices in animals. What we really need to do, and this is the work that's been happening, is how do you scale from that prototype stage yeah. some will provide more clinical clearance and that's a significant work in scaling up and what we are doing now is putting in the work to scale up and learning through a school of hard knocks all the challenges it takes to manufacture products that many of my colleagues here already know and over the last year we're able to make clinical size devices but we are started looking for ways to partner up with manufacturers with people who know how to make this in a more reliable scale, people who have IT, so we can make this go to patients faster. Okay. Um, so 
if there was one constraint that patients could potentially help you resolve in terms of the development of this product, what would you say it is? Is that interaction with the government? Uh, do we need some people who have got some LinkedIn connections to, you know, big device makers? What is it? Yeah. So certainly finding patients are great and they've given us input and continue, continue to give us input on human factors and what their preferences are. And that's one reason we moved away from having needles of blood outside the body. Going forward, what can they do? Yes, advocacy, as was mentioned this morning. And then for us, finding partners in the manufacturing space that can, you know, we can take it to a certain level of a prototype, but somebody has to move it to the next level. So we'd love yeah. to find partners in the industry and the corporate world that can help us move it to the next level. And that's what patients can talk to their network. Patients can encourage government to provide incentives to make that happen. Um, this is a question for both you and Barry, and, and I'm going to be really blunt here. I, do you feel, given that we spend billions, literally billions, on dialysis in this country each year, do you feel that the government is actually not putting enough money into the development of the next generation of products? Uh, no. <laughs> okay. No, <laughs> as in, can you clarify what the no means? No, they're not, or they, they no, you don't agree? They haven't put enough money into it when you compare it to other disease spaces and where we've been essentially... I think doing the same thing for the last almost um, 40 years, you know, since the early 70s when 72, um, it's, it, we definitely need additional funding. Uh, this is very challenging as we've seen through all the recent uh, companies, how expensive it is to bring these products to market and more expensive to, you know, keep the distribution up for the patients. So um, it definitely needs more funding. I agree. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, I know we're running short on time. I want to wrap up back with the uh, with the uh, sort of existing devices, both outside and next stage. Um, just one last question for you. And you're both obviously in home hemodialysis. Um, I have uh, studied this uh, modality upwards, backwards, sideways for a good uh, 15 years or so. Um, we have made some progress. Uh, there are more people doing home hemodialysis, but we're still not where Canada is or Australia is. Well, if this therapy is so great, what in the world is the problem? Why are we not growing this therapy faster? Either one of you, feel free to go ahead. <laughs> Daniel, you want to start? I'll start. I mean, with some things I've seen over the years, I think to some extent it's it's change across multiple stakeholders. So you you have a lot of nephrologists who didn't grow up with large, you know, managing large numbers of home hemodialysis patients, and so they don't necessarily want to start mid-career doing that. You have uh, healthcare providers, the clinics who many of them have certainly started uh, driving home, but for, for many years since, since Next Stage first came to the market, that wasn't the case. It was a very slow beginning, a very slow beginning, especially uh, you know if you, if you run a, a, a lot of centers, you're going to have to operationalize things and you want to do things very consistently. And home is not, is not consistent. Every, every water source is different. Every patient's power supply and home space is different. It's just a very different world than what is traditionally kind of the way you'd run an in-center company. So I think I think those have been barriers. And then, of course, to a patient, they just don't even hear about this option. Having been in next stage as long as I have, I tend to think the whole world is home hemodialysis. <laughs> and then I'll meet somebody who's at a center and they'll say, you can do this at home. I had no idea. Yeah. So you have no idea. We've been doing this 20 years, but people don't hear about it because it's it's such a small part of the dialysis care industry. Um, and so then there's a lack of awareness and it becomes something that's maybe strange or odd. And why would I do this at home? Uh, you know, I have to stick myself with a needle. That's scary. There are things we heard today that, that still remain true. I mean, those, those are sure. barriers to overcome. Yeah. Um, so. And uh, Dr. Aragon, just to yeah. wrap up, yeah. um, what, what, can, what can patients do to help accelerate? I mean, even existing home hemodialysis patients, people who are interested, what is it gonna take to, to yeah. push this forward? No, absolutely. And I 100% agree with Daniel. First is education. I mean, nephrologists themselves, I would say most nephrologists leaving their fellowship program have not managed a patient on home hemodialysis. And we talked about in one of the earlier sessions, you you prescribe what you're comfortable with. And if you're not comfortable with it, then then you don't. I, so I think that is one big problem that I think we're all we're all trying to address. Um, I, I think, too, you know, somewhere in the history of dialysis, we were doing more home and then we all shifted in center and we built a lot of infrastructure around in center. It's the easy button, so to speak, for for so many providers. Uh, you just go to an in center and, and, and things move quickly. It's a little more effort to educate a patient on a modality, to get them trained, to have them have them learn from the nurse. 
And, and that hasn't been our model. So we're asking people to get away from the infrastructure that's been built up for 30 to 40 years and go do something different. And so all that change, um, it's hard. I think it's something that we finally now have, you know, federal government is, is in. I think we've, you know, with everybody here, with new innovations, with those that are trying to push home technologies, the new technologies coming, we're finally seeing that. I think this group of patients that have joined us today is a big part of this as well. You, you need to you need to ask for it. This needs to be something you need to be empowered. We, we shouldn't be OK with being a passive member of our health care. And so we're trying to create easier devices. We need patients to be continue to advocate for that. I want to be empowered to do my own treatments. And I think if we you know, we push clinicians, we educate clinicians, we push providers, payers, the government continues to encourage us all to move that way. We'll, we'll get there. I mean, I, I feel really strongly we are going to get there now. If that's in a couple of years or longer, I think that really depends on how hard we really try to break some of the uh, old patterns of the way we've been doing things and really try to innovate not just the technology, but the care model. And that comes to me from from all stakeholders, the nurses, the physicians, the patients, the regulatory folks, payers. I mean, we've got to we've got to ask for it if we want to see it change. All right. Well, with that, I think we do need to wrap up. I wish you could go longer. But uh, again, thank you to all of our guests today. Uh, so greatly appreciated. And I'm sure our entire audience loved hearing all this information. So thanks again. Thank you. Eric. Thanks, Eric. Bye. Thanks, everyone. Hello, everybody. Welcome, 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 welcome to this segment. We are here. Can wait for some people to come in for this one. Um, hope you guys are enjoying yourself so far. Hello, hello, hello. Hello. Hey, how you doing? Look at everybody do. just jumped in there. Look at that. <laughs> you call, we come. I see <laughs> that. That's how we got to be. I hope everyone's doing well, enjoying the day today. How are we doing? How are we feeling? Great. Right. Thank, right, thank you. Yeah. Right. Awesome. awesome to meet you, David. Oh, pleasure. I've heard so yes. much about you, and I'm so happy to see you and enjoy you on this panel. Um, you know, this has been a great experience. It's probably the first webinar that I've tuned in to, like, almost as many sessions as I can. And uh, I've learned so much today, and I'm um, just happy to be a part of it. We're going to wait for a few people to come in here. I want to give you guys the proper introduction. Um, you guys make sure you jump in here and let's get some comments going, get some questions going. I know we got some really? behind the scenes people that are going to be shooting some questions to me. So we'll be getting audience questions. Okay. They got me moderating. Somebody let me have the keys to the car. I don't know, <laughs> I don't know who told these people it's going to be all right, but they let me in. We're going to have fun. We're going to take over today. All right. We're okay. having a good time. Sounds good. All right. Um, so, we are going to, I'm going to introduce myself. It's weird to introduce myself, but I'm going to try and do it. I um, hope that's okay with you guys. Uh, my name is David Rush. I am a platinum selling recording artist, motivational speaker. Um, I'm a patient doctor consultant and spokesperson, kidney advocate as well. I am a home hemodialysis user, a one-time transplant patient from my brother back in 2010. I uh, had that kidney for about seven and a half years, ended up losing it um, late 2018. Um, I was diagnosed with FSGS back in high school in 10th grade is where my journey started. Uh, I've been serving on the executive committee of the Northwestern uh, Kidney Core Center, NU Go Kidney, for the past six years. Um, I've also been consulting for different companies such as AstraZeneca, Outset Medical, um, a part of Kidney X, and I serve on the board of ASN alongside Dr. Quagan. Um, still making waves in the entertainment world as well. So writing and producing for television shows and uh, other artists, mixing and mastering their projects and uh, just doing my best to stay active. I'm not as much as a performer anymore. I do still record music and put music out, but kind of slowed down. I'm getting old. You see all the grades. I had to kind of cover it down a little bit. Um, but I, I live by the mantra wins only. I believe every day is a win. Every time we wake up, we are winning. Yes. When you're able to get up, breathe, when you're able to put your own clothes on, move your feet, feed your family, you have won so many times before the day's even started. Yes. So um, I try to put that energy out there to people and hope it is infectious to people to, to look at it from that crazy perspective. It seems like a crazy perspective, but if you live that way, life to me will seem so much happier mm -hmm. and uh, so much better. So that's me. 
enough of me. We're going to get to the real stars of the show. Um, Eric, I want to say your last name right. So, Dietzman. Good, close. Great. Dietzman. Oh, can you say it for me? Well, you know, the German would probably be Dietzman, but it's Dietzman in the States. <laughs> Dietzman. All right, I got it. So, Eric Dietzman, he is a patient advocate and contributor to the res Responsum Health. Am I saying that right? Yeah, that's right. Okay. At age 36, Eric's kidney shut down and he crashed into dialysis, later receiving a kidney transplant, which failed instantly. Eric has experienced all forms of dialysis and has found the one that, all, that allows him and his spouse to continue living full and have a productive life. Home hemodialysis with the next stage machine. Eric is a national speaker, author, advocate, and blogger on Facebook pages, paddling on dialysis for kidney health and black children, white parents and is uh, active with Home Dialyzers United. Welcome, Eric, it's so good to have you here. Um, if we could, I'll give you a round of applause myself right there. Here you go. Thank you. Thank you. Um, next, we have Dawn Lawler. I've seen her all day killing it on all of <laughs> all the sessions going on. She's a, She's been a star today. Uh, David, Lawler's do you remember when I first met you? Yes. Okay. Yeah, I was going to say that. I just wanted to make sure because yeah, you stuck in my brain all these years. You. That's awesome. Thank you. Um, Dawn Lawler, she is an ESRD patient and two-time transplant recipient. She's also a dialysis nurse and the kidney care option educator at U.S. Renal Care. In the early 2000s, Dawn dialyzed in center at the same clinic where she works as a dialysis nurse. That's crazy. Prior to receiving her transplant today, she works to educate patients about their home dialysis options. Y'all give a round of applause for Dawn. Thank you, Welcome, Dawn. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we have Melvin and Cleo Covington. Melvin is a 23-year U.S. Air Force veteran with an end-stage kidney disease, and Cleo is his wife and care partner. Give it up for the care partners. Gotta love it. They have been doing home dialysis, home hemodialysis since 2018, first on Next Stage before switching to Tableau for greater flexibility. Melvin and Cleo are high school sweethearts and have been married for 46 years oh my God. with four children and nine grandchildren. I envy that. I'm wow. also married. I'm married to my high school sweetheart. We've been together 23 years, married for 12. Okay. We have two kids, 11 and 10 years old. I bet it I have no grandkids, no time soon. All right. So welcome all of you. Let's give them a round of applause as well. And welcome everybody who's in the room watching we're gonna have a good time here with this round table discussion guys i just want to open this up and uh we're gonna start off here um i think i'm gonna throw this first question to eric i just want to throw this out to you and, and answer this question and then we'll go around the room um we all have our experience here as you know as patients there's no cookie cutter method to this journey that we've been on everybody has a special story and uh, i want you want you guys to be able to answer these questions with me so the first question Eric, when you had to start dialysis, how did you choose what kind of dialysis you wanted to do? And were you given options? I always say in the beginning, when you learn that you're about to go on dialysis or learn that you're gonna deal with any type of chronic disease, you kind of go deaf, dumb, and blind for a little bit, Absolutely. where you don't really hear what's going on. You don't know what's going on. The pamphlet means nothing to us. And you know we don't read them. They kind of end up in the back of the car. Um, what made you choose where you were and were you given the options? Do you remember getting the options or did you just kind of do the, do it on your own to kind of find out? Sure. So that was back in 2001 for me. There was two options. There was uh, in-center and there was PD. Mm -hmm. And, mm -hmm. you know, I was sick with uremia. And so um, I knew my wife had tested and was going to be a transplant, uh, give me one of her kidneys in about five months. So PD just was way out of my realm of like thinking I could do that for myself. So right. that, you know, I guess we're going in center, you know, and that was crashing with the catheter and then you know, later a fistula. Um, so we got, got that transplant and just like you, David, uh, except for my, my kidney only lasted like seven and a half minutes due to mm. Um mm -hmm. And so then basically it was a search with my wife and I for our best outcome ever since based on the technology that's available to us at the time. So, you know, after that failed transplant, we went home with a big machine and a reverse osmosis. My wife really was running me. I was working full time. And, mm -hmm. and I realized, you know, we had a 15 month old son, Jacob. I realized, you know, this she needs to be with him, not taking care of me. So I moved to PD. I, and the way I moved to PD is I felt better. 
So mm. you know, don't be afraid of that initial in-center dialysis. If you can skip it, I think that's better. But if right. you can't skip it, you know, it's going to make you feel better. It's going to take right. your off. It's going to make your heart feel better. And then it clears your head. You can start making some of these decisions for yourself. So just real quickly, so from that PD, I got that second transplant because with my FSGS, we had to find out if it reoccurred. It did. And right. so after that, I was in center for a year, and I found next stage. And I thought, I'm going home because I need the best. Because by then, we adopted our daughter from birth when she was three. Or, I mean, no, when I was on my third year of PD, she was zero. I mean, she was <laughs> from there. Um, she was but, the first born three. Got it. But, <laughs> Be there, and you know, here's the hardest part: is that you know, back then, and I don't know, they might still be using this statistic. I was told I got seven years on average to live, right? Most of us yep. hear that kind of crazy stuff, and we're yep. ready to write our will, and you know, just like say okay, you know, and be sad as heck. Um, right. But that's why we got to do what everybody's been saying today: advocate, learn. And then from, and the other thing is, I haven't been afraid to move from clinic to clinic. Okay. Right. I'm at Fresenius now, but you know, in 06, Fresenius said, we don't have next stage. You can go home again with a big machine. I said, no. Then I had to move to DaVita because DaVita um, said, we have next stage. You can use it. So I had to drive right. around. And then lastly, and I'll, I'll clear, close it right here. I want to do nocturnal. My friend Bill Peckham uh, was doing nocturnal. We were talking on a, a Yahoo chat. And he was doing it. Rich Berkowitz was doing it. These are some kind of pioneers who unfortunately are no longer with us. And I said, I want to do that. Davida said, we can't do that. It's not you know, legally available because it's not FDA approved. Mm -hmm. I went to Henry Ford Hospital in Detroit and they said, you know what? We're going to do it off label for you. And so for 14 years, I've been doing nocturnal. And, and let me say, based on what we just heard, you know, in our last couple of panels, I'm looking forward to what might be my next best option right right to, to feel better and to live longer and like i said in the beginning it's, you're not a cookie cutter patient so it has to be what is right for the patient there's a lot of different modalities out there and in the beginning we may not have the education um or the knowledge of these things you know we just found out that our life is about to go into this whirlwind change and we're just yeah. trying to figure out how we're going to go to the next step um, I remember them telling me at 24, I only had a year to live if I didn't start dialysis. I didn't even have anything figured out in my life yet. So it's just like, when you hear that, it's kind of traumatizing to you. So you're not really thinking about, okay, what's my option here? You're just thinking about, am I going to make it to tomorrow? So, you know, I want to throw this over to you. Um, I want to throw this, this question over to you, Don. When you, when you hear about this and, you know, choosing the options and doing stuff like that, I mean, how were you you know, given the options of knowing what you wanted to do? Like, was you was you informed by your doctors? Were you given information by your nurses, your techs, or was it something you had to find on your own? None. I got none. Mm. And I was, I was a dialysis nurse. <laughs> wow. So that was the crazy part of it was, and, you know, that's what I tried to explain to the panel before that, you know, I'm someone who works in dialysis. I, I consider myself extremely knowledgeable. I've been a dialysis nurse for 22 years. Mm -hmm. And yet I'm in the chair and I really have no idea what's going on because now I'm a patient and I'm a patient who's really sick. Because what happened was I got my first uh, transplant preemptively and felt great right away. I had a living mm -hmm. unrelated. And so I had that for six and a half years and now the kidney's failing. So what happened was I was actually in Washington, D.C. at a collaborative with uh, a surgeon from Hartford Hospital. Mm -hmm. And this is when my kidney, like, is really now, it's it's in the trash. I had been in denial that I wasn't feeling well for quite a few months leading up to it. Mm -hmm. But I actually get sick there with my with a transplant surgeon. So long story short, I end up back in the hospital, and um, he's doing everything he can to save this kidney. I'm going through plasmapheresis. So they have no antibodies. You know, I'm, they've got me on all of these steroids. I mean, I was, you know, my catheters were all getting infected. It was just horrible. But um, I think that part of the reason was because I was so sick at that point that once they discharged me from the hospital and I went in center, um, it took me a while before I came around. I was, I was pretty right. sick. Um, and at that point, you know, my sister was um, working on getting worked up to donate her kidney to me, which I have now. But, you know, as a nurse, I always thought to myself, 
you know, why aren't people doing what we tell them that they should be doing to lead healthier, better lives, like watching their diet, watching their fluid, you know, why are they coming in so heavy? But when you're there in the chair, I mean, you know, half of the things you're not hearing, half of the things you don't want to hear, you know, like uh, Dick was saying, everything's about what you can't do and everything that you could do is gone. Um, right. And so now when I talk to patients, you know, I have that perspective. I, I, I know how, about how much they're going to hear, mm -hmm. but like, as I listen to a lot of the people today, the difference is, is that in the beginning, when you're first told you have ESRD and you have to start dialysis, um, it's hard because there is no hope. When somebody says, oh, you're good, you're going to die in a year if you don't go on hemo. And then if you go on dialysis, you may only live seven years. I mean, none of those things are good news. Right. So where, where's your mind then? It's, it's, right. it's in the, it's in the dumps the, the, you're just go into that almost instant depression. But when I hear t people today talk about being on a home modality, right, which I have not yet got to experience, but the difference for me is that I hear the hope now mm -hmm. of the people aren't depressed, right? Mm -hmm. I, I didn't hear one person today that gave me any sign that they were depressed. Right. And so for me to be hearing that from other people that are on dialysis, you know, that aren't transplant patients and, you know, people in the situation I'm in right now, it, it, it helps me to refocus my mind and the way that I, I come to people. It can't be cookie cutter. It can't be, you know, Hey, just lay out the facts. Like you said about the brochure. Now, mm -hmm. Yes. All of my brochures with my card are on the back seat of everybody's car. That's true. It's I, very true. So it it's very true. Myself, I got to pick up that phone, not mm -hmm. wonder, oh, yeah, they're home reading the brochure, so they don't need to hear from me. Right, no, right. I need to keep calling them yes. and supporting them and giving them hope because right. they probably don't have it at this point. And I didn't have it then either. And it's, um, it's, it's very true. Very true. Yeah. Yeah. So we, we, we have, you know, we, we've talked about the, uh, the aspect of almost like the mental health aspect of this, you know, like we, and it's probably one of the things that's not touched on enough um, in therapy is the mental health aspect of the patient, how you go kind of from living this life to trying to find some type of normalcy in this life that everyone isn't doing. You could sit in the room and center, it's 40 people in there, you still feel by yourself. You know what I mean? Uh, we was talking about that earlier. Um, you know, I definitely want to kick it over to uh, to uh, Mr. Melvin and, and, and Cleo, the Covingtons over there. I see you <laughs> in, your, in your dialysis room over there. Got your dialysis chair. See the table. Yes. Right <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Uh -huh. I see all the organization, all the files and everything like that. Um, yeah. You know, like, talk to me about how you chose Tableau. And, and let me know, you know, let, if you could let me know the journey to picking this modality. How'd you get there? Well, when I started out in in uh, 2018, uh, Dr. Broman was my uh, nephrologist, and he uh, he just asked me, well, I'm interested in uh, home dialysis. And so me and the wife discussed it. We're like, home dialysis, we could pretty much do, do it when we want to, flexibility. We're like, mm -hmm. okay, well, um, let's do that. So I've never been in center. So um, we, wow. started, we started out the great. next day. Yes, and, straight, uh, straight in. Wow, that's that beautiful. Great. Yeah. I train on him. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Awesome. So doing, so knowing that, you know, like we, let's, let's jump into the next question here. And I want, I want to see, I want to give you guys a, I want to give you guys kind of a, a test here. We're going to play a game. Okay. If, if, if we could do in about three to four words, if I, if I ask you to give me three words or three, three words, what are the main advantages that home dialysis has to offer? Now I know Dawn, I know you, you're not doing home, but if you were to do home, give me three words that home dialysis gives you and offers you. Let me start. Time is one. Is one word for me. Time. Home dialysis offers me time. Who can give me another another word? Flexibility for me. Flexibility. Yes. Eric. Uh, mine are live longer, better. Um, you know because it, it's 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 hard to get that done. That's good good exercise, David. Right. But you know, I want to live long. I want to see grandkids, but not too soon. I want to <laughs> do it well. And you know, the last, right. I, the fourth word would be travel. You know, of keep course. on the road. Of course, Don. Control. Control. 
control. I yeah, I'm a control right. freak. I'm an independent person. I want to do what I want to do when I want to do it. And I right. never want to be in the position where I can't nurse okay. for other people, even if I, I have to nurse myself. And um, just so you all know, I'm going to be a grandmother in February. Oh, my first hey, child. Hey, and it's a girl. Congratulations. <laughs> that's a wonderful thing. So that's my biggest motivation now is I never thought I'd live long enough to see a grandbaby. Mm, I just beautiful. Mm, so beautiful. for me, it's huge. Huge. Yeah. So so being that being that we have different type of modalities here, everyone's on different modalities. Can we list the main differences from the tableau? Me being on the top, I've done tableau, I've done next stage, I've been in center, I've been transplanting. I can list the different things. So being that we do have um, different modality users in here, can we throw out like what are the main differences between the options that we have that you can think of off the top of your head? Let's uh, let's start with Cleo and uh, and, and Melvin. What are the what are the main differences? Okay, well, I'll give you some of the main differences for me. Mm -hmm. What I missed that the main difference is that Melvin feels better. He has more energy. Yeah. He gets up from treatment and he go and he do so much. Next stage saved his life because he had to start on next stage. And that was a wonderful thing. But when we were introduced to Tableau by Dr. Broman, mm -hmm. Tableau was interesting to me because I love the machine. I love the system. It's easy to clean up. It's easy to set up. It controls mm -hmm. itself. It literally tells you every step to take. You don't right. get confused. But next stage was very hard because of hanging bags, because the water system, pure flow didn't work. And then when you travel, you had to hang bags. Right. And traveling, you had to log that machine around. That was very difficult. But mm -hmm. next, with Tableau, Tableau tells you everything you have to do step by step. There's no confusion. Mm -hmm. The alarms mm -hmm. come up, which is very seldom. It tells you exactly how to solve that problem. Mm -hmm. Right. You don't have to look up in a book or call technical hmm. support to find out what to do. Tablet right. tells you right there, as you also know yourself. You yes, ma'am. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Uh, like I said, the cleanup, the setup, the um, flexibility also, to be able to do it. Yeah, also, storage. Storage, storage is, is a huge very, change. Very, right. yeah. Yes. You don't have a yep. whole lot of it's bags boxes. all over the yeah. place. Yeah. Yeah. Right. And, and like I said, the most important point is how much difference melvin feels yeah i feel great mm -hmm. he is awesome. so energetic and he feels good and i try to prepare the best diets i can don like you said you know you got to be careful about how you eat i try to prepare the best meals that i can for him for the whole family actually and it it helps a lot to eat correctly and Pablo just That's makes awesome. it so simple for me to be able to prepare those meals while he's on the machine i can right. literally just Go to the kitchen and cook and come back. Tablet runs itself. I don't have to right. do that. The next stage, I had to do blood pressures every 30 minutes. Tablet takes the blood pressures by itself. Right. It's a big difference. I love more, you, more you sound, So it sounds like it's more user friendly for you guys and, and yeah. give really you is. advantage to do to do others. Eric, if I could if I could get your opinion on with another modality, can you tell me the differences for you uh through your journey? So I gotta just say, Don. My sister, Don Edwards, just put out, get your sexy back. You know, yes. we were talking about that one word. And libido, you know, I just got to say on next stage, uh, and I, you know, I have no uh, experience with Tableau yet because I just, it hasn't come into my hemisphere. But, you right. know, after a, a few weeks or a few months on, um, on next stage, and now it's doing a short-term daily then, I wrote the president of the company. I said, this stuff is better than Viagra. And what I <laughs> is that, you know, we got my sexy back. I wouldn't use the word sexy. Maybe yeah, you can sexy. use the word sexy. We all sexy today, baby. I'm okay. Listen, Dawn is sexy. I got to tell you, when she walks yes. in the room, she's yeah. a she's a presence. Yeah. I, so I just wanted to make sure we got Don's. You know, get, <laughs> oh, yeah. A lot, yeah. A, lot like, on a lot of these. Right. I, we're both doing He's that. amazing. <laughs> uh, so, you know, I got to say, I've been, I've traveled a lot this year. I've been out to Seattle. I've been out to Boston down to South Carolina, uh, San Diego with the family. Um, I'm going to DC next week and, uh, you know, list keeps going. And for me, that has been the biggest thing is being able to travel with, um, next age, you know, awesome. I agree with you, Melvin and your, and, and your missus, uh, you know, it's a lot of work. Sure. It is. Mm -hmm. It is it's a 70 pound machine that becomes a hundred pound machine when you want to take it on an airplane. Yeah. Yeah. But you know what? 
I hate missing more than two days. I'd really rather not even miss two days. And I feel mm-hmm. great when I have dialysis. And so rather than like on a third day waiting to do it when I get home, I do it the night before, you know, right. deal, just because, right. you know, we all know how we feel when we don't get enough dialysis. That's mm-hmm. the Very true. Oh, Very true. We crave more. We crave to feel better. So it's true. That, that, you know, those, those bags that we hate and love, you know, <laughs> yeah. I started with Next Stage before there was a pure flow. You know, yeah. me too. <laughs> yeah, well, you really yeah. started. Yeah, you know, me too. And that's why we need a new, that's why we need something new. I mean, that's why yeah. I'm so excited about our past panelists, right? We got right, some, right, right. some but, great yeah. stuff coming down the line. Definitely some great stuff coming down the line. And I remember those bag days. I was a, a bag, I was a 10, 10 bag user. Oh, yeah. yeah, I was eight. I remember yeah. how crazy. Right? Yeah. So, mm-hmm. You know, we, we can we could talk about those bags all day, but we're gonna keep it moving. <laughs> so, since we do, since we do, Don, I want to I'm gonna I'm gonna ask you this question right here. Um, we talk about we see care partners. We see here with Chloe, Chloe and Melvin. Um, and, and before we get to that, like with, with travel, with travel with Tableau. Speaking from travel, I want to go to travel real quick, and then we will get to this next question. Um. I used to travel. I took the next stage on a, on a 45 city tour when I was doing music. And, but it was six guys that looked like me traveling with the machine. It was, <laughs> Looking all the stuff. It was easier to, to move it around. And, I, and it was early on when I got all the questions. There really wasn't a, a mandate for it on the airplanes. They wanted to know what it was. They, you know, they almost didn't let me fly. It, it was, there was a lot of things I had to deal with from state to state. And I worked with a lot of DeVitas and getting my you know, stuff from every city when I was working. We started from West Coast all the way down back to New York. So, um, you know, I've traveled extensively with the Next Stage Machine and, had, and, and encountered every type of, pit, type of pitfall. But with Tableau, um, I can speak for myself with traveling. Even though I can't take the machine with me, the, the batching system allows me to kind of travel freely, knowing I can come back and not have to make a batch. Because, I, you know, I was a 60 liter on Next Stage. Crazy. And I had to make the batch every treatment. Yeah, that timing is really tough. Week. Mm-hmm. And you hear that jigga 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 jigga. Oh, <laughs> oh my goodness. Yeah. And then, and then, uh, but then, you know, also like what it was, if I missed my timing with travel, say my flight was delayed or I had to spend another day, when I came back, that batch was now unusable. Right. Now I had to drain it and then, and then make remake make the batch yeah. or hang the 10 and, bags and do the spiders. Bags yeah. The spiders, there just wasn't enough spiders to go around. Yeah. For yeah. Oh, I don't know how you. So with the Tableau, I'm able to do my treatment, instant batching. If I leave out of town and I go out for a day and come back, I can come back and treat immediately. I maybe just have to eat for an hour Mm -hmm. and I can treat. So how is traveling for you with the Tableau? And uh, we heard how it is with Eric with traveling. How is it for you with the Tableau with traveling? Well, well we yeah, actually, we, we had to uh, what worked really good for us. Unfortunately, we had two funerals this year. One of his I'm brothers sure, yeah. and one of my sister's side. Wow. What we did is that we did the treatment through the weekend. We usually take the weekend off. We did it through the weekend. We was able to go to the funerals, take those two days off, come back, yeah. and mm-hmm. come right back, back into treatment. Yeah. And it didn't mm. bother him at all. So That's awesome. And yeah. also, most of the hospitals have and centers have tableau machines now. So if it do occur that you are out of town and you got to have treatment, you can set up and go get treatment done on Tableau. That's nice. Okay. Well, it would that be great, great because you feel the same. Yep, you get that yeah. same feeling. That with same us. outcome. Yeah, right? feel, yes, yeah, you do. Feel the same. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So we talk about we we see we have a care partner here. I, I just want to I want to shoot this over to Don. So do you think um, everyone would need a care partner? I know you don't do. I know you don't do um, a home modality, but if you did. Did you feel that everyone would need a care partner to be successful? A lot of people sometimes may not have that care partner with them, may not have that support system in the home with them. But a lot of people are independently doing treatment at home as well. Right, right. Do you feel like a, a care partner is needed for success at home? Um, I, th- I think need is a good word. I mean, I think everybody needs support, but I don't think it's um, it's necessary for every person. Mm-hmm. So as a nurse, I've had a couple of patients that, I would say could absolutely do it themselves at home solo and right. be perfectly safe. Um, right. So I think that that's up to, you know, the doctor, the nurse and the patient to, you know, say, could I do this by myself? I mean, right. I wouldn't want anyone to tell me that I couldn't do it alone because you just can't. Mm-hmm. I, I could, I'm fairly confident I could do it by myself. 
Mm -hmm. Um, Mm -hmm. I wouldn't want anybody to keep me from that. Um, Would it be um, easier for me if you, if I had a care partner, of course, but I wouldn't want to be kept from that quality of life because someone felt like they could tell me that I couldn't do it alone. Right. You You know, the risks, most people know the risks you're in a, you're in a fairly long training period with your nurse. So Mm -hmm. your nurse is going to have to train you on every aspect, watch you do everything. Um, You may have to stay there a little bit longer. um, And maybe the nurse needs to come to your home a little bit longer to make sure that you are safe and that you know the emergency, um, you know, techniques and and what you're going to do in an emergency. But um, I mean, you know, you, you could come into that too. Would you want anybody to tell you that you couldn't do it by yourself? Of course not. I mean, <laughs> you know, because yeah. you lose you lose a lot of independence when you become a patient. And right. I think you know we we want to we want to have that. I keep using the word normalcy. We just want to say right. you know we I got I got it. I could you know I could do it. I still want to be able to take my kid to school, make them lunch, pick them up, and do treatment in the same day. You know what I mean? And okay. you know I, sometimes you feel like you got to do it on your own. They right. gave me the ten minute ten minute alert here. I still have a couple great questions coming in that I want to get to. So. Me too as a whole, we're all excited, but you know, the countdown's coming. So let's get all of our answers in. So that way I want to hear the feedback from everybody from these questions. Um, a question that I've got here, Don, do you think that is it more freeing for PD or HHD, which is easier for travel? Which one would you think? Well, PD is definitely easier. I mean, okay. um, I think that most people, their experience with home and even in most centers, um, unless there was a reason a patient couldn't do PD, it's mm-hmm. usually the first line of home treatment, unless you can't get a catheter or something of that nature. You can do it alone. It is at night while you sleep. It is very easy to travel with. Um, okay. And so most most patients that go to HHD in our area are transitions from PD to home hemo. So, so the other thing that's great about PD is it doesn't involve blood. Um, right. And there's not, you know, the... The cycler is very um, easy and, you know, friendly to use. So it kind of gives a person a comfort level that, yes, I can do dialysis at home. Um, And once you're used to caring for yourself, if you had to go to HHD, usually the transitioner is easier for the patient because they've been at home already. So a lot of that anxiety is not there. Kind of of done out. Chris, you have to a little bit. David? Eric, uh, Eric, I hear you got something to add. Go ahead. Yeah, sure. So I've done both, right? I mean, I've taken like 30 cases of uh, PD dialysis to Jamaica with my son and my wife. And, you know, the only difference to me is the weight of the machine. Um, once you're committed to going to wherever you're going, I, I, mean, I did PD exchanges in Disney World in the first aid center. You know, I've hung a bag in my car as I'm driving to clinic or something like that when I went down to Ann Arbor. Um, but I don't see, to me, it's not easier. And it, the other thing, if I had what I know now, um, I think PD is great for all the reasons that Dawn has said PD is right. great. I stopped making urine like that. And so when I was on PD, I mean, I gained 60 pounds. Right. I didn't care because, you know, I was home doing the things that Dawn has said is always, you know, it was good for me. But so right now, I think if I knew what I knew, if I have no urine at all, I would definitely want to go to leave home to HHD. Mm-hmm. I agree. Okay, so so I have a question. I want to get this in real quick. Uh, and I want everybody to answer this one. Um, how do you fit this treatment into your life when you dialyze to live? Or, you know, before, you know, we will revolve life around dialysis. You know what I mean? And it's like, I have to do my dialysis so I can't do this and can't do that. Yeah. Now that, you know, there's some at your home and as a nurse, Don, seeing this, how do you, how is it now? Does your life revolve around dialysis or does dialysis now revolve around your life being a part of your life? I want everybody to kind of answer this for us. No particular order. Jump right in when you, when you feel you got an answer. Well, for me, um, dialysis does not uh, evolve my, my, around my life. I pretty much go do stuff I need to do now. When I first started out, it did. It was so, you know, so important to me. And I, hey, I got to do this. I got to do treatment. I got to do this. But right. now... I, I, I based everything out around it. I pretty much like, okay, I got I got to do this today. I got to do that. And I pretty much come home and uh, then we do dialysis. Nice. And nice. for me, I have a system, you know, we just pick, don't necessarily have to do it a certain time. We do it when we want to do it. 
we're kind of like night owls, so we usually do it at night. Nice. Do it y'all hanging heavy, hanging heavy, huh? Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Sometimes we do it early in the day, so it allows me to go and do what I want to do and to prepare meals, to do my shopping, hang out with my girls, you know, and nice. my babies and my everything. And special time for him and he and I to have together. Nice. We have that special mm-hmm. time now. We didn't have that so much in the beginning, but we right. do need it. Like I said, Tableau gives us a lot of flexibility. Awesome. Eric, if you can. Sure. You know, the greatest thing I did when I went to Nocturnal is I had my young children, Jacob and Antonia, down in their rooms, down the hall. I was laying next to my wife. And eight hours later, I get up, you know, pull my needles out, good to go. So that's how I fit it into my life. And when I had the short-term daily, I was doing just like you are. You were, David. My kids were younger. And I had to, you know, make sure I got that timing in right so I could get somebody from daycare, be there at the bus stop, you know, mm-hmm. plus everything else, right? So, yeah. and it, that, so anyways, that's how I fit it in is nocturnally. But, you know, I hear some good things about what you guys are using, Melvin and uh, David. Uh, I hear some things that, you know, you can get some pretty good dialysis efficiencies, yeah. you know, yes. about four days per week. That, you know, it, 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 it is. It's that's why I'm open, you know. I'm open to good awesome. things. But awesome. I, love, I love nocturnal and I wanted to just hit on that solo, you know, to me, you know, and the word independence has been brought up a couple of times. I feel so much more independent when I don't have to rely on my care partner and, but she's available if I need to, yeah. but I feel like when I'm traveling, I'm doing it on my own, you know, so I, you know, I can definitely do next stage alone. Right. Same here. I was doing mine alone too. I just, just sometimes you don't want to burden those people, but if, when you got one that stick by you, like I see Cleo yeah. sticking on now, but you yes. gotta ride out. Right? I know. You you gotta ride out. We're, we're like, we're so together, you know, we're so mates. Don't, don't yeah, but, you, know, you know what they say, love makes everything better, right? Yeah. Yeah. And, and that makes right. me feel good, and yeah. that makes me happy. Yes. That's awesome. That's awesome. Yeah. We are running down on time. I want to, I'm, I'm probably going to squeeze one more question in here. I'm going to try and push it to the limit real quick. Um. So, are there any important things you're missing out? You know what? Matter of fact, we're gonna skip this. I want to get some words of wisdom. We got we got four minutes left before I got a, three minutes left before I got to kick mm-hmm. it over. If all you could take one minute, give me some words of wisdom to people who are thinking about getting on home dialysis, who may be on home dialysis struggling, people who may be in center. What can we give them? What type of motivation can we give them? Let's get everybody get a minute and let's start with you, Dawn. And let's let's give let's give some feedback to the people who are watching. Don't be afraid. Give yourself a chance. Have faith in yourself. You can do it and you can feel better. Awesome. Cleo, Melvin, let me, can I get something from you? I would say if you are thinking about the possibility of uh, home dialysis and you're in center now, hey, you got to go with the change and it, it'll work out for you because I feel better out there. And the I would say the your medical staff because they're there for you. You just have to ask questions mm-hmm. and just go, there. go with it. You'll be surprised how good it is. I would just add that, that, um, you know what, if it doesn't work for you, there's a chair waiting for you, okay? So you don't know how good you can feel until you take that step into doing whether it's peritoneal uh, or home hemo on whatever machine works for you. Whatever it is, right. Take the step, and you know what? And you can come back and say, I'm back here. Or you could say that didn't work for me. I want to try PD. You know, that, just don't worry about it. You're you're not going to lose your chair. Amen. Do what you need to do for yourself. Always try and go to it with the best mindset. Keep great people in your your um your circle. Smile as much as you can. Live as much as you can. And just be happy about life. Every time you wake up, you've made it to another day to fight. We are warriors. I want to thank this beautiful panel for being with me today. I had a great time with you guys. Thank it was a great discussion. This, awesome. whole day, this whole day it's has nice been amazing. All of you. Awesome. All of you. Very nice. Let's let's continue to keep this good energy with each other. Let's stay safe and uh, let's keep smiling. I appreciate you guys. I want to thank you for this great discussion. I'm going to throw this over to Vibrita Schiller with Satellite Healthcare to give us some closing remarks on a beautiful day. Guys, take care of yourself. Good job, David. Good job. Take care. Thank you very much, David, for the kind introduction. And thank you for the wonderful panel sharing so generously your experiences. Hello, everybody. My name is Brigitte Schiller. I'm a nephrologist and the chief medical officer at Satellite Healthcare since 2010. 
Satellite is thrilled to be one of the main sponsors of today's event. Satellite is a nonprofit organization founded by a physician, Dr. Norm Copeland, 48 years ago. Dr. Copeland was all about patient care and was centered around making things better so that patients can actually do dialysis closer to their home. He established the first freestanding dialysis center outside of a hospital. Nowadays, uh, obviously not a novelty, but certainly a pioneering effort in 1974. In, we serve now about 8,000, more than 8,000 patients in five different states. After opening the first freestanding dialysis center 20 years later, we opened the first freestanding home dialysis training and education centers, which we named Wellbound. In those centers, patients get education prior to starting dialysis on all the different modalities. And if they choose home dialysis, they will be trained there and all their follow-up care is happening at this center. This allowed us over the last few years to have 20 to 23% of our patients being benefiting from home dialysis efforts, while the country was less than 10% currently is at 14%. So it can be done. We're committed to individualized care for each patient who trusts us with their life. For this, we want to understand who the individual is who seeks dialysis services, who their families are, what goals and dreams do they have for their lives? What do you want? What is the best dialysis modality for you to live the life that you are hoping for? Over the past 20 years, we have learned so much from our patients and their families. The fear of starting dialysis at home at the beginning prevents some from even considering home dialysis. We see it as our responsibility to make sure that every patient who would like to undergo home dialysis to develop the confidence to do it. It is our job to make that happen. This requires a personalized approach and it starts with getting to know every single patient. Every individual has different needs, different stories, different goals and dreams. But there's an underlying common thread for all of us and that is the need to be seen, acknowledged, cared for, and loved, to live the life filled with hope and meaning and purpose. And this human need is universal, with or without dialysis. We talk about love being the secret ingredient for superior quality care. And we stress this with every new employee because we actually, quite frankly, understand very well when one of our loved ones is sick, we know exactly what we want for that loved one. We know and feel what loving, tender care looks like and feels like. And I would like you to ask for wherever you dialyze for that tender, loving care. You deserve that. Stand up for yourself, advocate for yourself. This is how care should look. You have had now the opportunity to hear from many professionals, dialyzer colleagues, care partners, people who develop products for home dialysis, and organizations who cover and um, approach all aspects of kidney care. You may feel a bit overwhelmed about all this info that you received and worry what to do next. Well, I have really good news for you. All the materials, the resources and information that was shared today will be posted on the HDU and AKF website with the option to reach all the sponsors for more information. I would like to encourage you to participate in this information experience sharing with other people in your community, to be a spokesperson for home dialysis, to become a peer mentor and a role model for so many others. Nephrologists go through long training, many years of studying. But what I can actually also tell you is that the best teaching we get from you. Over the past 20 plus years, I have learned so much more from you and this had made me a professional, a better professional and a better person. Because I always have to think about what is still not working, what can be done better, how can we improve? Many years ago, when I was in private practice, 
a patient of mine, we name him Frank, was very interested to find out everything about dialysis. He knew that I had done uh, nephrology care in other countries, and so he wanted to also find out what other countries are doing. He then had the chance to go to France on vacation and to undergo dialysis there. When he came back, he told me something that has stayed with me forever. He said to me, Brigitte, if you know that something can be done better, tell the American people, the American people will want it and they will make it happen. As you can imagine over the last 20 plus years, I've been thinking about this very often because most of the days I'm thinking about what can be done better. And I would like to invite you now also to build dialysis for many others by spreading the word. Tell the American people and they will want it and they will make it happen. Spread the word, be honest with each other, talk about the realities, but never accept that things are good enough. In 1963, home hemodialysis was started because a young girl named Carolyn Helms was not able to receive dialysis through the process that existed back then. But she was lucky enough to be surrounded by caring engineers and physicians and a loving mother who provided that nocturnal home hemodialysis with a machine when you look at it, you can hardly imagine how it actually functions. We have much better products, but it's a wonderful example that I often remind myself that different and progress is happening and it requires this force of love to do better for others, for those who we care. And so the community, all of what you've heard here, the many options that exist, the future innovations that are coming, this does not end today with this meeting. This community that you've just joined, more than a thousand are participating in the meeting today, will go on because the community is strong and it has filled me with joy to see this community grow and mature over the past few years. In this community, there's influence and power. It exists after this meeting where you can get answers, where a connection is just an email, a phone call, a tweet, or um, text away. Use it, connect with each other so that more good can happen for anybody who requires dialysis. I want to thank you all for attending today, for the inspiration that you have provided for me for many years and for each other today. You may not be surprised that uh, you are with me most of my days, always thinking about what can and should be done differently. Allow me one personal um, last thought. Life often brings challenges to any of us. Sometimes it's difficult and emotionally draining. One thing that has helped me over time in my life is to visualize what I would like to be, to change or to adapt to. When clarity is missing, when I don't know what needs to be done, I'm writing down pro and cons. It helps me to prioritize. I realize I can't have everything, but I can have anything. I need to decide what that anything is. And as I write it down or I visualize what that should look like in the future, I come to this point of clarity where I understand this is the way to go. And even if worries afterwards still come back, they're minimal and I can go the route and stick with my decision. I hope this may help you to go on with hope, confidence and courage to find the life you choose to integrate dialysis into it so it serves you. Don't live, uh, dialyze to live, don't live to dialyze. There is more. There is you and your uniqueness with your talents and strength that make your community, your families, wherever that is, a better place. I will always be enormously grateful and filled with love for all you give and have given so generously. Be well and thank you. <laughs>